It is my great honor and uh, pleasure to be here with Professor Idima and uh, all of you. Thank you to all the organizers um, and Professor Liu for your invitation. Um, please allow me uh, to go right in because what I'm going to share today uh, is going to follow quite well with what Professor Idima just uh, did and connect to Yue Wei's talk on Qingshu uh, later on. So um, I'd like to focus on uh, three la uh, Japanese language and three uh, Korean language white snake films from the mid 1950s to the late 1970s. Uh, this is this, uh, what I call the Cold War cinematic episode that's often uh, very much understudied uh, in the White Snake repertoire. Um, I'd like to focus on the multi-directional interactions with Chinese cultural traditions, uh, the World War II, uh, American occupation, and uh, Japanese colonialism in a global context. I'd also like to um, explore some of the deeper connections uh, with Chinese cultural traditions in the context of East and Southeast Asia. So these um, uh, six films, which I don't think I have any uh, time to explore in detail, uh, but I'd really like to share because um, of my own sort of excitement of uh, putting them in context, uh, but also um, um, how the, uh, they are very much overlooked in their own national cinematic traditions, maybe with the exception of Ugetsu, um, but it's often studied as a Japanese cinema classic, not in the context of the White Snake films. So I'd like to start with uh, Ugetsu um, and um, ask you to pay attention to its, of course, director and its cast and crew members. Um, First, I'd like to uh, highlight its monochrome quality, the black and white aesthetics. Um, if you look closely, you can see the um, silk texture in the kimono. You can see the light and shadows uh, when the candles are lit. So there are infinite shades of gray in, these, um, in this portrayal of, the, um, of Lady Wakasa, who is this ghost uh, woman figure based on um, the white snake figure uh, from Jase Noin, which Professor Idima mentioned from Ueda Akinali's Ugetsu Monogatari. Um, so when you look at the opening of their uh, night after, the morning after their first sexual encounter, you'll, you'll see the, um, the black and white aesthetics and the um, silk uh, quality of the kimono. But when they are at the, um, hot spring, you'll see the, the identity of the enchantress. So this more demonic figure in the Japanese tradition that uh, Professor Idema just mentioned but also the flow of water and sexual energy, even beyond the spring. And then it leads to this modern um, picnic scene in a spring field that will be revisited in um, the Korean film that I will mention uh, immediately after um, the three Japanese films. So when you look at the female ghost, the floating water and the mutual enchantment between the, um, the female ghost and um, her human lover, you see uh, from the Chinese perspective, but if you are thinking dojoji and the Japanese perspective, that might be a very different picture. I'd love to see that in context later on today. Um, but here you see the, um, you know, the nurse figure, which is the green snake figure that Professor Idima mentioned. First, uh, she appears, uh, of course, here she's another female ghost and the nurse figure. But in the older Jap uh, Chinese tales from, for example, 9th, 10th century, uh, the Li Huang tale, you always have an older servant woman, the maid uh, nurse um, figure uh, that's uh, also quite uh, appropriately uh, figured here in the um, who gets the story. Um, because of the time constraint, I'm just going to move to uh, quickly to the second story, which is the first color feature live action film uh, in post-war Japan. Um, another uh, sort of adaptation of the White Snake Tale, uh, Byaku Fujin no Yone. 
So here you pay attention to the cast and crew, uh, including Yamaguchi Yoshiko, who is also known as Li Xianglan in Chinese. So here I'd like to only mention two things. One is the materiality and the color symbolism of the manifested desire in the story. When you looked at the, uh, for example, how the red scarf or red handkerchief first appeared, I'm going to show the opening, which is going to establish the time of the story, Song Dynasty China, and the location, uh, West Lake in Hangzhou. Then you're going to be introduced to um, the Xu Xian, the human lover character, lotus flower, or the symbolism, uh, but also green snake. Uh, she is in green, blue, as Professor Udima says. She can be a, a, a fish, a snake, and in blue and green, depending on how you translate qi in Chinese. Uh, similarly, the white pearl from white snake uh, or bai niang in this lady white to Xu Xian um, character, he holds the pearl in his hand, uh, transmitted uh, with um, help of a leaf and water to him, similar to the transfer of desire with the red scarf. So the material um, transmitter here, the red scarf comes back multiple times to manifest desire. He holds it and let it cover his face. You can feel the multi-sensory um, contact after returning from his first meeting with White Snake, dreaming about blissful future encounters. After he was exiled, uh, the human lover um, in the love story that's reinvented throughout 19th and 20th centuries. And the women, the snake women followed him there. However, the red scarf betrayed his insistence that he's forgotten them. It flew out of his chest as if by magic um, and reminding him of his hidden desire. So he was shocked uh, to witness this, this red scarf himself and quickly threw it on the floor. A close-up of the red scarf on the floor presents his desire in flamboyant color. So this is a color, uh, the first color feature film as red as blood as fierce as fire. The second theme I want to highlight for the 1956 Japanese film is how special effect. When I say as if by magic, it's made possible by special effect. The red scarf was able to do its job, um, including in the final scene when it became a real long scarf, connecting the lovers uh, when they ascend to heaven. Um, so this red scarf is the magical bond. Such special effects were most vividly displayed in the scene when White Snake fought the Taoist exorcist. This is a film. Um, this is the first time when a green screen was used in the history of Japanese filmmaking. So, um, which made possible the disappearance of the Taoist in a blink of an eye, and how uh, we saw him uh, hanging in midair. And then uh, we saw him in a close-up hanging upside down from the, from the eve of the pagoda. These internal qualities of desire and power aided by special effects are promoted through a range of marketing strategies with Hong Kong as its co-production partner and a base for distribution. Uh, this Japanese film reached um, in dubbing in, in Mandarin Chinese and other languages uh, to Southeast Asia and beyond as seen in this Thai language poster and Chinese language posters used uh, for screening in Malaysia, Singapore, and other parts of Southeast Asia. Our third um, Japanese film is the 1958 animation, um, Hakujaden, or Bai Shouzhuan in Chinese. You can see the um, very interesting connections here. Um, if we compare these two Japanese uh, white snake films two years apart, you can see visible traces from um, live action to animation. And the hybrid creatures of the snake woman and the fish girl. So this version uh, is faithful to the Feng Monglong version when the uh, green snake, um, um, blue, uh, it's not green snake, but a blue fish. I want to focus on the episode of uh, when the white snake uh, is going to attain the flower of life to revive Xu Xian, her husband. 
Um, here she flew through a realistic universe as if um, um, the later Astro Boy, and she goes to uh, the Dragon King, uh, the red planet, to plea for a uh, flower of life. Um, when you think about the connection between the flower of life um, um, and the fiery planet, um, it may have something to do with nuclear explosion and uh, the fear of it in post-war Japan. And it may also have been um, um, connected to the so-called master of the monster movie, who is also the special effect director of um, um, the live action film we mentioned. And this animation continues this uh, sort of appreciation of this closer look of a hellish scene when you see some of the maybe snake-like details in this, uh, in this scene in the fire. The flower of life also echoes the flower decoration on um, Bai Niang's hairpiece. Um, that, and that will be um, continuing in the um, Korean version that I'm going to quickly touch upon. Um, Japan's desire to compete with Disney and its use of Chinese elements such as panda, American elements such as Donna Duck, in this film, you can see all these elements or Kung Fu Panda, which opens up later anim animation um, history, um, could also open up conversation about um, Disney of the East and about Sino-Japanese-US relationship. So a quick summary before we go to the um, Korean cases, which is good, I still have half of the time. So Japan, um, these Japanese films uh, really show love and reconciliation um, seem to be at key at the post-war moment for Japan. But Japan also wants to compete for markets and uh, such a drive was at the same time nationalistic and industrialist. Um, it also, again, as I always see, things are very connected and not black and white. They also pushed artistic and technological um, innovation um, and commercial development at the same time. So this kind of humanity of the non-human um, is very much connected with um, film technology, special effects, as well as um, how the, um, the requirement for reconciliation is very much uh, in demand at the time. The Korean cases are even more obscure um, and I'm very excited to put them together and maybe in dialogue with other uh, presentations later. Um, the, uh, the very first Korean case study is uh, Shin Sang Oh's uh, Peksa Puin. Peksa Puin uh, is from 1960 for Madame White Snake. Um, it is one of the typical post colonial Korean film industry products. Um, Shin Sang Oh is himself educated in Japan, just like many of his uh, cohorts of Korean, um, early Korean artists and filmmakers. When you look at this film, uh, which is very overlooked, um, but when you put it in the context, in the larger context of the white snake repertoire, it actually reveals a lot of layers of cultural inference and multidirectional interaction um, among mainland China, Japan, South Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, United States, and um, regions of Southeast Asia. I will uh, try to show a little bit of that in the time I have. For example, the script of this 1960. Korean film was uh, taken from the 1956 live action um, film uh, from Japan. So in Japanese, because they read Japanese, they are educated in Japanese. Here, Shin sang -ho's wife, actress Choi eun um, she starred as uh, White Snake. The shadow uh, of Uge lingers on in this black and white Korean film. As I mentioned, this um, love scene will be uh, reenacted in a different manner uh, in the 1960 Korean film. But you can also see um, traces of um, Uget in a different way uh, in terms of, for example, the veil of White Snake uh, is very much um, in the style of Lady Wakasa. And you can see uh, the, the shots uh, with Chong Ah or the green snake character and how she's gazing towards uh, outside the frame where the human lover is. And you can see this uh, uh, setup. 
But what I want to emphasize in the time I have is um, bodily contacts, especially hand holding, seems a striking feature in this film, um, distinguishing it from previous adaptations. I'm going to the end of, uh, end of the ritual, she holds Hosong, which is the Xu Xian character's hand, for about 10 seconds while proposing to give him a tour of the garden. And this garden scene uh, reminds us of the pearl trans transmitting of desire, uh, which is an imitation or in a much um, more shabby uh, shooting condition and black and white and less expensive props because of the economy in um, Korea at the time in 1960. And of course, holding hands leads to a confession of love and a sexual intercourse. And the, uh, uh, also uh, chatting as a modern couple, just like the uh, picnic scene. But here you have the white snake uh, in a dominant position. So this is a little revision uh, from the Japanese um, picnic scene in Ugetsu. So the lovers, uh, sort of white snake earns uh, her human lovers uh, complete confession of love in a sense through her complete devotion to him. Again, she um, has exchanged her magic power for humanity and um, sort of they had to be saved from drowning in water by the goddess of mercy. Here, I'm going to uh, um, mention a little bit of the doubling of the white snake and the goddess of mercy, Guan Yin that Professor Idima already mentioned. But in this, um, in this story, it's quite interesting. Um, the goddess of mercy pardons their transgressions and orders the abbot, the, the Buddhist monk, to let them go anywhere they wish. So the film ends with Hosong carrying Madam White to the boat. The moment is reminiscent of the film's opening and the two ride away together in a shared boat um, and live happily ever after. You can't imagine this kind of ending in um, the Chinese version. Um, and um, this is very much influenced by the 1958 Japanese animation, which ended in exactly the same scene, which leads to Shaw Brothers, its collaborator, to break away from the Japanese production company, um, the toy animation, because they, they felt it's very much uh, deviating from the, the Chinese story. Um, before moving to the second Korean film, I will briefly mention Shaw Brothers uh, by Shaw Zhuan uh, from Hong Kong in 1962. Um, if you don't know any White Snake versions from the period I'm covering today, this may be the only uh, film you know. Uh, it's the most popular Mandarin language um, film um, of White Snake in the 1960s. But after we comb through the previous versions, we now know this film is very much influenced by layers of inferences from, for example, Tian Han's Peking Opera of 1953, mainland Huangmei opera films in the mid 1950s, and uh, Japanese white snake films from the 1950s, and possibly the Xin Sang-o 1960 version that I just mentioned. However, this is the most influential um, in the Chinese speaking word. And this version uh, in turn um, sort of provided further incentives for Xin Sang-o, the Korean filmmaker to come back, make a second attempt because it became so popular throughout, throughout Asia. And it also influenced um, a Singaporean uh, Chinese American librettist, Suri Slim Jacobs who is the creator of the 2011 Pulitzer Prize winning um, Western opera, Madame White Snake, uh, with Boston Opera. When she was growing up in a traditional Chinese family uh, in colonial Singapore in the 1960s. So Xin Sang O's second attempt in 1969 um, is called Sa Nyo or Snake Woman. And um, the audience of Sa Nyo prob probably will not have hesitated to call it a horror film. It opens like one. Um, this is very much similar to the, to the original uh, story that became Do Dojoji, I think. So two craftsmen in the mountains and they are searching for some ancient trees to make a Buddhist statue. Um, and they sort of had to stay the night in the cave. The opening, I only have time maybe for <laughs> It's very loud. 
it opens like a horror film with the blue light, the ears, the zombie part, and the transformation of the snake into a beautiful woman. she kills the old man um, as a snake demon should in the uh, the assumption is it's she is evil demonic using her poison but then she fell in love with the handsome young man um, when she look look at the, the, the smile on face and this sort of um, exchange of gazes so basically the film opens with the snake woman killing one man and falling in love with another and establishes a very complex and uh, ambivalent atmosphere for the hybrid genre of horror and romantic fantasy. But here you see, um, you have laser, you have martial arts fighting, you have all the other genre uh, that's uh, coming up and rising in the uh, inter-Asian uh, cinematic network. Uh, so just like the protagonists transgressive identity is very obvious in this 1969 snake woman film. The film itself became a fascinating hybrid, uh, simultaneously inviting classification as a romantic fantasy, a horror film, and a martial arts film. The latter two genre, horror and martial arts, are becoming increasingly um, inferential in a transborder Asian market from the late 1960s onward. In fact, Shin Sang-ho, the director himself, um, had started collaborating with uh, Shaw Brothers in Hong Kong in the 1960s and would go on to uh, Hong Kong himself to make martial arts ghost films in the 1970s. So um, I'm going to actually skip some of the themes such as um, the importance of hands, uh, the philosophic musing between craftsmen the maker of the statue and the statue, which is um, a very, um, you know, in metamorphosis in many of the Western um, associations that we can think about, um, picture of Dorian Gray. Um, but in the process of making the Buddhist statue, uh, which we don't know what it will turn out like, the, the maker is using his wife, whose identity, snake woman identity, he wasn't aware of um, as a model. The doubling of the snake woman and the goddess of mercy introduces this element of horror in the romantic uh, comedy, because what eventually emerges uh, is a statue of um, Guan Yin or the Buddhist, of, uh, Buddhist goddess of mercy, but half of the face looks like the, the wife and half of the face looks like Guan Yin. So it's um, quite a horrifying uh, um, with the audience knowing the, the identity of the wife, it's quite horrifying. Um, I'd like to echo a little bit what uh, Professor Idima talked about uh, this, the snake woman and her son. This is the only film among all the films that actually preserved the song uh, in, the, in this episode of Cold War cinematic recreations of the white snake tale from um, 50s to the 70s. So here you see the, um, in an exquisitely composed bed scene, the dangerous blue light um, changed to a rosy pink. But the, the film immediately cuts to five years later when they already have a son and uh, the nuclear family of three Play, play a visit to uh, the old craftsman's grave. So the, the snake woman who uh, had the old man killed in the beginning now became um, a filial um, uh, daughter figure to this old, older man, but also a good wife and wise mother. But then throughout the film, you see her internal uh, struggle uh, to remain good uh, to, against her demonic um, um, character. The ultimate savior for this unlikely couple would still have to be the Buddhist um, goddess of mercy, Guan Yin herself. But in a final twist of the 1969 Korean film, the Buddhist abbot himself turns out to be Guan Yin in disguise. So this is 
even more crazy in terms of the, the terms uh, who um, Guayin herself um, was disguised as the Buddhist abbot. Um, and she finally resurrects the snake woman, allowing her to join her husband and young boy to live happily after in this life. So they don't have to ascend to heaven uh, to, to live a happily ever after in the afterlife. They can actually uh, form a family and live happily after in this life. So with these two Xin Sangho films in mind, uh, the 1975 Xin Bai Shi from Taiwan is worthy a quick note. Before I have explored the Japanese and Korean versions coming before this film, I have, uh, I'm really uh, sort of um, surprised by the Taiwan film because it combines slapstick comedy, martial arts film, erotic film, and romantic fantasy. But after I explored Xin Sangho, I can see uh, quite clearly how the Japanese and Korean connections facilitate a deeper understanding of what's coming up. Uh, the genre of hybridization and many of the sort of um, uh, de demonic and humanization uh, um, at the same time um, that's coming up in Taiwan and Hong Kong in the 70s. So the last film I may have a minute to introduce is um, the 1978 film, Zhen Bai Shi Zhuan. Uh, we don't take this as a Korean film, of course, in, um, in the Chinese speaking word, but if you uh, use Korean archives, it will be portrayed as a Korean film um, and a Korean language film uh, co-produced in Korea. The reason I think has something to do with, of course, you can see the uh, Chinese Korean bilingual poster here, uh, starring the Taiwanese actress, Bridget Lin Qingxia. And if you look at uh, some of the outdoor scenes here, for example, the st stealing magic herb scene, um, you will know it's shot on location in Korea. This, this kind of structure and some of the statues and even the fence here. So it's shot on location in South Korea. So you, you can, maybe they can claim co-production in that sense. And um, it might also have something to do with what Sang Jun Lee has called counterfeit co-productions, which is used to, um, to sort of cheat against the importing quota at the time. So there's, there's a lot to be said, but we don't really have time anymore. Um, so I want to summarize the Korean White Snake films in an inter-Asian context. Basically, I want to highlight how it continues with the love and sacrifice and maternal salvation element, but how it also sort of feed back to uh, Chinese speaking word uh, in a very much multi-directional interactive fashion. So the reason I want to emphasize multi-directional conversation is because I don't want to treat the Japanese and Korean white snake um, um, productions as uh, somehow uh, 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 trivial or somehow um, uh, um, sort of branches to the Chinese uh, um, stories. I'd like to uh, really respect their uh, contributions and complexities and think that they've created uh, their, I consider they've created their own traditions and left strong legacies for contemporary Asian and global popular cultures, which I think um, will be definitely uh, raised up in the Qin discussion later. Thank you so much for your patience and attention. <laughs>